Hi, I'm Sean Kimber, I'm a math professor at Lafayette College, and I run our Center for Teaching and Learning, and I am co-PI on this grant um, that was given to the Lehigh Valley Association of Independent Colleges. You should be happy that I got all that out, um, <laughs> which is six schools just north of here in Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton, Pennsylvania. Um, and so I, I'm going to give you a quick overview of our grant project. Um, and then we have two faculty members who actually did projects under our grant to tell us about what they did. Um, then our project manager will talk about lessons learned, and then my um, fellow co-PI will talk about sustaining collaboration and we'll open up for questions, okay? Um, so the uh, project overall was an endeavor to build digital literacy in the faculty in our consortium so that we can start getting on board with the 21st century trend of incorporating technology into education. We are residential colleges, so online education isn't necessarily a primary goal of what we're doing here, although many of our colleges are involved in it. Um, so we want to investigate what it means to incorporate um, digital tools in this residential environment, our faculty have a range of experiences doing online education, um, but we have tons of doubts and fears um, about our future relevance as an institution of higher education if things start to migrate online, um, but also just plain old fears. So we're very classical sorts of schools um, with a lot of um, face-to-face -face education, and it's truly about the relationships that we build with our students. And so there's some wonder about how um, going digital can change that. Um, so we had this initial goal of building a, um, a cadre of faculty who would get confident and then go out and become educators. So a train-the-trainer kind of model. Um, that didn't turn out to be exactly what we achieved, but we certainly have quite a few adventurous faculty who are infecting their colleagues. <laughs> um, and then we also wanted to, this was Teagle's goal, but also became one of ours, to share our resources across campus. Primarily we're sharing intellectual resources, so these are small colleges where um, you might not have full expertise to offer a major or minor on one campus, but if you share among the six schools, um, we can build something bigger. Um, we also want to promote collaboration among faculty members and then also among our IT professionals and librarians. Um, so the activities that we put forth through the grant effort, a um, major effort that we put in was to have um, three cohorts of cross-campus teams of faculty members working together to change a course or build modules that could then be dropped into any course. And we did it for three years. The first year had, uh, first cohort had longer than one year to work on their projects. Um, that turned out to not actually be a good idea. Um, and we can address that in the Q&A. Um, but we did go for the model of finding the faculty who were interested in doing it and supporting them. That's sort of a bottom-up model. The top-down model would be to identify strategic areas where all the campuses need a, um, a need filled, um, but, and then kind of try to make faculty fill that need in this way, and we chose not to do that. Um, it probably would have been better had we done both, um, because we trade off sustainability by going from bottom-up. Um, and then here are just some sample subjects. So we did not focus on any one discipline. Uh, we did try to assess the needs and challenges across the board. So we have humanities, social sciences, engineering, and science covered. Um, we did some training workshops. So there's no need to assume that faculty know the digital tools that are out there, nor that they have the time to fully train themselves up. So um, we had digital tools conferences every year um, that were 
presented by faculty in the area and IT professionals. Um, we also did both face-to-face -face workshops and online modules about how to make a video, how to be ADA compliant, and um, just, hey, you've never used an app before. Here's where you find them, here's how they work, and here's how you might incorporate them into your course. Uh, we also had several invited speakers, fairly well known. Um, Jennifer Sporer from here at Grand Mar kind of kicked everything off. We had Emily Bishop who talked about the future technology in higher ed. And then just last week, Lauren Herkus, who's a professor of anthropology at Carnegie Mellon, um, she actually studies the culture of faculty in higher ed around the incorporation of new uh, teaching techniques. And so in particular, she's worked on several projects involving technology. And then we also had annual cross-cohort sharing sessions where the previous cohort would come in and school the new cohort on like mistakes to avoid. Um, we did find that all cohorts repeated the same mistakes despite <laughs> that warning. Um, but it was always just heartening to see how far the team got in a year and then that they had the wisdom to then impart it on the next group, whether they listened or not. And then behind the scenes, we ran it with two co-PIs. So like I said, I, I run our Center for Teaching and Learning at Lafayette College, and then Diane Dimitrov, who is the Executive Director for LVAIC, the consortium, she and I kind of led the effort to make sure that these cohorts were doing what they're doing with the aid of, at first, we had a consortial instructional designer because there wasn't a lot of support for this on all of the campuses, and so if we could provide one for the project, then they would uh, range between the campuses. We thought that'd be great. But at the same time, all the campuses hired instructional designers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we were able to provide even extra support at that time, but what we realized so we might need more project management. So we have a project manager now, and she'll be telling you more in detail about those challenges are later. Um, we had a cross-campus steering committee, so representatives from every campus, and that included librarians, um, IT staff, and the staff of the consortium, in addition to faculty members, um, to identify the challenges and come up with sort of strategic solutions. This is the group of people that identified that we might want to have that consortial and instructional designer, for instance. Um, and then all that information data got fed into two different cohorts that meet. So there's a separate IT ID community of all those staff members from all the campuses who regularly meet. They're getting fed some of the challenges that we have and are troubleshooting for us. And then that's going to require resources, so then that then goes to the group of uh, chief academic officers who pay for everything and um, and it's a feedback loop and so we feel like we're at a great place where everyone's ready to go and launch into doing these things and then finally we assess our project of course um, including counting numbers of students in classrooms numbers of faculty at different ranks who are involved um, but we're actually also interested in the concept of collaboration as a thing in and of itself. And so the Wilder survey is a measurement of the degree of collaboration within a team. And so we've had our faculty fill those out. It's been illuminating. And then we added on a focus group um, to ask those questions more directly and tease out a little bit more information. So that's the project. And so we want to have you hear from two of our faculty who work on different projects, and the first is Chris Rubin. All right. <clears throat> so um, thanks for coming today. Um, uh, the project that I worked on was with colleagues at Moravian College. Uh, we have a Department of Economics at Lafayette and a Department of Economics, Accounting, and Business. Uh, at uh, Moravian, and so you'll see a little bit of overlap with that, uh, those subjects that we're covering. 
Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about learning objectives. Uh, I have a lot of slides, so those are the ones that I'll try to move quickly through. Um, a little bit about the courses and how they work with those objectives. And I think a little bit of the focus here is on collaboration tools, but there's a lot more going on than just the digital collaboration, and that's maybe the, the challenge. So um, kind of generally across both campuses, we have uh, quantitative uh, goals uh, for our students. Um, and uh, the main thing that was going on here is that at Moravian, uh, they introduced a new class um, in a kind of statistics uh, prep before taking marketing research. Um, as at most small liberal arts colleges, you never know who comes into that class, who leaves it, where they go afterwards, is it really a bunch of people coming in and going straight to marketing research? So there's a lot of different things uh, that we had to cover there. But we also then, um, this meant that we kind of uh, went across two different semesters. So we had one class uh, in, in kind of a prep to beef up the statistical uh, abilities. And um, then we also had in our marketing research classes, uh, the idea that we were looking at um, community-based learning and research. So a lot of marketing research classes have a big project. Um, sometimes they're little projects that students do, uh, but both Gary uh, at uh, Moravian College and I have moved to do big projects. And in those big projects, there's already a digital sharing as well as a kind of class sharing of what each of the students are doing. Uh, but our idea was that we could do more of this across campuses. Um, I will not give you a spoiler, I'll just spoil it. It didn't work out that well, but we're getting it, okay. All right, so we've, uh, although Gary and I have uh, previous uh, experience and uh, Sabrina and I had experience uh, working together on community-based projects, um, coordinating across campuses is really difficult. So I'll talk as much about the tools that we used within a given campus uh, to collaborate uh, uh, much more than really what we were able to do across campuses. So um, in uh, that marketing research class, uh, we have a lot of goals about uh, exposing students to doing research, to thinking about what they're learning in the classroom and how to apply it uh, in the community. Um, and in a sense, by you know, even just collaborating with Gary, he and I talked about our different goals that we had for the classes, the two different projects that we had on each of our campuses. You caught that right, two different projects, right? So the amount of collaboration that we were, were able to do was limited. And it's not just um, that collaboration across campuses is hard for faculty, but it's really hard for students. In any case, uh, we, were, we meant to use this, this community-based learning and research as a way to expose students to uh, different ideas. Um, uh, so, yeah. This is a slide we can skip pretty quickly. Um, so um, we did a lot with uh, the digital tools to think about what we were doing. Of course, we've got classroom time. We tried to schedule our classes at the same time or maybe with one time in the week at the same time. Gary was department chair at the time. Uh, I had other things going on too. It meant that there were lots of constraints that kept us from doing all of the collaboration uh, that we wanted to do. Um, we did have virtual meeting spaces. Uh, we thought about using Skype, but again, because we didn't meet at the same time, we used Zoom uh, to record. But a key feature of Zoom that um, I was able to use uh, as a conferencing tool, but a key feature of Zoom is that you've got to press the record button. <laughs> yeah. And then it's all done, and you haven't pressed the record button. But Zoom was incredibly useful because the collaboration at Lafayette College uh, also included a collaboration with a production group in New York City that came onto campus. We thought about theater, um, and the leader of that group wasn't able to make it to Lafayette, so we connected with him through Zoom. We had uh, people uh, from that production company in the class uh, as well as there, but I did forget to press record, so it was a tough thing. Um, and, and that also speaks to some extent to um, support in the classroom uh, by people who think about the technology and only the technology, rather than think of thinking about, did I get my two people here? What are they gonna talk about? Um, is the guy gonna, does he really know what we're talking about? How's this gonna go? Um, how am I managing the students talking to each other and, and things like this? It was a great session, it just didn't get recorded. Um, 
So we use Google Apps. Uh, things change over time. It's been quite a while since this course was taught. Fortunately, I, I taught another course since then that I can uh, refer to as well. Um, okay. Uh, so um, in that first semester, taught my, by my colleague Sabrina, um, the class did um, some screencasting that was used across semesters to kind of communicate the idea of an institutional re review board or IRB and all that that's involved, uh, that that involves in the project. So her students in the first semester of our two semester plan did these recordings that we were then able to share with students in the second semester to think about uh, the IRB. And the students really got into it. That has a play button, but we're not going to need to really look at the video. Uh, but, but the students really did respond to it, and it was a way for them to think about uh, IRBs and, and um, also you know, make those connections across the semesters. As I said, um, there are times when we impose prereqs to a class, but there are times when imposing prereqs is difficult because there's a lot of ways to get into a class. So marketing research class, although it uses stats extensively, there's a number of ways in which students might come to it. So these students who took the first semester class uh, were able to communicate to some extent to the students who were different in that next class, although there was some overlap. So um, just then to think about these tools that we're, we're using, um, uh, some of you may be familiar with Moodle. Um, this is what we have used for quite some time, and I th it looks like we will be using for quite some time at Lafayette. Um, so, you know, just simply posting the readings, uh, things that we're going to be doing. Um, so that's the simple uh, Moodle uh, example. But then, in order to break out of Moodle and use the tools that are also available, of course, we can put uh, not only um, the links to the community site, but we can also have the surveys within Moodle, although there are survey uh, tools outside of Moodle as well. Usually this works pretty well. Um, and then we can go through uh, these steps of posting to Google communities uh, in uh, the process of developing a research plan uh, in marketing research. So although this was available across communities, we also had some challenges with um, sharing those communities uh, partly because the particularly adept um, tech person was Sabrina, who taught in the fall, not my colleague Gary, who taught in the spring. So in addition to me not pressing the play button, although Gary pressed the play button on his class, uh, there was some challenge in getting this uh, Google Groups to, to work together across uh, the ways. So we used uh, Google Communities. Um, I, I used it a year ago. These things change so fast that my knowledge may not be incredibly up to date. Some of you may know better what Google is doing, Google communities are doing right now. Um, it's a fairly spare interface, um, and it's one that you have to be careful if you're going to share outside of your uh, institution. You have to set it up that way from the start, or at least we did before, and uh, you can't change it afterwards. Turns out Sabrina set hers up not in, not knowing that crucial piece of information, and so none of us could see her site. And there's nothing you can do to change it afterwards. You'd have to rebuild the whole site and all the, all the activity. So it's a pretty spare interface. Um, this is from uh, Sabrina's site. So this is some examples of um, uh, some of the discussions uh, that she had uh, with her site. They had a book discussion uh, that is a, a fairly narrative book about statistics, which is a nice book. Uh, this then is the way that I set up my site so that I had um, categories, so that these were categories of the um, groups that students were in and the types of uh, the, the, the aspects of their projects that they would cover. So by clicking on faculty staff dash impact, it's easy for all of the posts from this category to be shown rather than here, you might be able to see that this is a light blue right here, so it's all posts. So by, by tagging them correctly, here's the initial research proposal for the group that was thinking about the impact of this theater uh, project on faculty and staff. Here's a post from uh, the group that was thinking about uh, how they were going to design uh, their work uh, for social media and having that interact with, um, uh, with the, the theater development. Um, then we had um, documents on um, Google Communities. Um, and uh, so in addition to the posts where we had 
uh, the um, comments. Uh, we also had then um, actual documents that, that folks created. Um, we had, here's some examples of the questions that we asked, and I'm actually trying to get to a different, okay. So this then is an example of the Google Docs, where, um, you know, of course, as you may know, uh, you can set up um, sections uh, to look at different parts. Chapter eight wasn't that we had ch eight chapters in the report, it was an application of chapter eight from the textbook. Um, and so uh, it was pretty easy then, uh, outside of Moodle, to use the different pieces of uh, Google, uh, the communities and Google Docs, as well as links from Mo Moodle to help students get there uh, to do uh, these ideas. Okay. So um, then I'll finish uh, thinking a little bit about um, uh, how we can improve, but it's difficult because uh, that first bullet right there um, is actually what makes it hard even for, so we're called uh, Lehigh Valley Association of Independent Colleges, something, yeah, around Alvaic. And students can take classes, and we talk about this, you know, uh, at uh, admissions talks about, you can take classes. If you want to take a business class at Lehigh, you can, you can drive to Lehigh and work it in your schedule and mm -hmm. deal with the fact that Lehigh might start a week earlier and go. So it's tough. And so it means that um, even when we have that digital connection, it's tough to make, to make those connections. Um, uh, the virtual interaction between students has big uh, uh, possibilities through um, uh, hiccups and such. We weren't able to use that as much, but what we did find is that traveling to see each other is pretty difficult. Even on, on my own campus, when I've collaborated with another faculty member, uh, bringing our students together uh, was very challenging, although we were able to do it a couple times. Um, remote video is great. Uh, we need to think about the people who uh, support that, as well as the faculty who can uh, do the right thing about pressing the play button. Um, and uh, the interface of different tools these days, right, not only are there, is there a different interface when you interact with a Google design uh, uh, paradigm, but also, that Google design paradigm, or it may be Moodle, or maybe whatever, uh, is changing over time. And so actually having students uh, understand what they're doing and how to do it is um, difficult. Of course, faculty members, we've talked about support. There's a lot of roles that may um, impinge on that. Uh, but at least we had the beginnings of, an, of the possibility for collaborating on uh, community-based learning and research. And really, those projects are um, part of the focus that we hope to move forward with as well. So, thank you. Yes, I think, yeah. Okay, hi, I'm Carrie Colibroy. I'm an associate professor of chemistry. So, I should have brought a quiz. How are you feeling? <laughs> Ready to go? So, I do chemistry, and this was a, um, our project was on building a video archive to support mostly teaching and, to some extent, research across our campuses, specifically focused on instrumentation. So, in, as science um, scientists, we use really expensive pieces of instrumentation. Um, don't call them machines, we get really offended. So, an instrument might cost, for example, an NMR spectrometer at Muhlenberg College might cost a million dollars. Um, a type of mass spectrometer that they have at Moravian College costs a quarter of a million dollars. So these are really expensive pieces of instrumentation, and it's really hard to get your hands on all of them at one campus. So collaborating across can be really advantageous. A second goal um, was to enhance learning in our classrooms. So here's the people that worked with this project on me. So down here is the Muhlenberg crew. We are three blonde chemists um, in the chemistry department at Muhlenberg. This is Mark Shabar and this is Sherry Young. Um, Mark Snyder up here is a chemical engineer at Lehigh. And these guys are at Moravian College. This is Steve Dunham and Chris. So um, the collaboration components I'll explain um, as I go along. But our goal was to leverage faculty time, expand hybrid learning options, and increase collaboration. So instrumentation videos, um, perhaps I don't have to argue to this crowd, but YouTube's pretty popular and pretty useful, right? So, like, my kid wants to learn to knit. I don't know how to knit, so I pull it up on YouTube. I'm like, I'm sure it's on here. We can figure out how to knit. 
right? And so the principle is the same. Instrumentation is pretty complicated. There's lots of buttons to push. There's things you should never do. There's things you always need to do. And so making video helps enhance learning. We wanted to be able to have instructional material that could be repeatedly accessed by students outside of class. Improving confidence and reducing breakage. When your instrument is a million dollars and students break it, you're very sad. So the other problem is that to deliver a chemistry degree or a chemical engineering degree or a molecular biology degree that is competitive on a national landscape, students have to have access to this instrumentation and they have to know how to operate it and how to interpret the data that's produced from it. But that means that you have to use it, but then you have the whole they might break it problem. So allowing them to practice outside the classroom was really important. We wanted to improve learning in the laboratory by focusing on the why by worrying less about the how. If I have a laboratory of 16 students and I'm demonstrating an instrument, we all know this if you've been in the classroom. The ones in the back have no idea what's going on. And the ones in the front are a, might, might not be able to process that auditory information, the visual, all of that happening at once. You've got all kinds of learning differences in the classroom. So you're really not providing instruction in a way that reaches every student uh, repeatedly and effectively. And we wanted to preserve instructor time for higher order learning. Because the learning that we're doing, especially in the liberal arts environment, we're arguing that our time is best used on the problem solving and not on telling you which buttons to push. Right? Because if you, even if you happen to go into chemistry and you happen to use an NMR, again, it's going to be a different instrument and the buttons are going to be different, right? But the principle of reasoning with the instrument is what matters. And we were spending way too much time in our classroom laboratories like, no, 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 honey, push this button. Like, stop that. Wait, hold it this way. And this is not higher order learning. So we wanted to really replace, um, replace that and do better. We also wanted to remove barriers to research collaboration. So and we're little colleges um, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Most of us, Lehigh is bigger than the rest. And we all have unique pieces of instrumentation that are really expensive. But actually collaborating, as you heard from my colleague Chris, is very hard. It's hard to get across campuses. You've got to find someone to teach you how to use that piece of instrumentation. You have to promise them, cross your heart, hope to die that you won't break it while they're letting you use it. And then what if you want your students to use it? Ah, like, this is hard, right? Now, we have an NMR at Muhlenberg, and Steve Dunham at Moravian was coming over to use our NMR already. This was already happening, because they don't have an equivalent instrument at Moravian. So we wanted to improve those collaborations. So our vision was interinstitutional collaboration. We wanted students using these high-impact pieces of instrumentation that are really expensive and hard to reproduce across campuses. We wanted to improve laboratory instruction by leveraging our time. And at that point, this was a couple of years ago when we started this project, we were building really what was the first and only instrumentation video archive for undergraduate education in kind of the chemical and biochemical sciences. And I've gone on to talk about this in a couple of places. Um, this particular project has made its way into two different NSF proposals, one coming out of Lehigh and one coming, mine coming out of Muhlenberg. And I can tell you that there's a lot of impact of the project. The concept is really relevant to a lot of people do, that do what I do. So oh, and this is the this is open source uh, video hosting that we use to host the video. That had some challenges. All right, so our goals were first to inventory and target our instrumentation, prioritize what we were going to work with. We're going to make video, so we need to find technology that we can all use. and. This all started because I started taking my iPad, which I have right there, I carry with me everywhere, and I would slap it up and just hit record as I was showing the student how to do something. And that, that like morphed and grew into making, I don't know, I think they look pretty professional, quality video. You can, you can watch them and tell me what you think. Because um, you're all going to look up NMR now. Have you Googled it yet? Have you figured out what it is? NMR, <laughs> nuclear magnetic resonance. So um, we needed to be able to make video. We did some workshops. We had um, the instructional designer you heard about, the one that was across the consortium. We had, she came and taught us stuff about ADA compliance, which I knew nothing about regarding video before we started. And so that was really informative and incredibly helpful. We filmed video. We edited video. Um, I'm so proud of my colleagues because, you know, Marsha Barr has been at Muhlenberg for 40 years. She was there before they had computers. So she learned how to do all of this. Like she filmed, she hit record on an iPad. She figured out and learned how to edit. And I'm just so proud of her for, uh, for being brave. And we really did raise the digital literacy, especially in chemistry. And it's trickled out across the science division as well. 
Um, while we were doing this, and I can credit Sherry Young for really spearheading a lot of this assessment, she, we collected assessment data on our classes since this, a lot of our video, three chemists, our video was traveling through organic chemistry, um, a lot of it that we created at Muhlenberg. And so that's a big cohort. Organic chemistry at a liberal arts college will run about 100 students every semester. So we were able to assess how the video was improving or not improving, but it was improving their learning, as well as quantify how much time they were spending. So what did we make? Um, the short, here's a, a table of the stuff that we did, but the, the short uh, story is that we made a lot of videos at Muhlenberg. And since I started the project and kind of ran it, the kind of the energy and the expertise kind of started at Muhlenberg and moved outward. It was very hard to initiate kind of cell, the same kind of cell in Lehigh and at um, Meridian. But that being said, we did um, videos in microwave assisted reactions, NMR spectroscopy, protein chromatography, solid phase synthesis, flash chromatography, and there's this the small angle x-ray scattering instrument that's at Lehigh, we actually had students collaborate. My students did a project on that instrument at Lehigh. It did require that they drove there, um, but it's the only instrument of its kind in the valley. So that was cool. And that student, one is employed at Pfizer and one is now in graduate school um, at Jefferson. So the, one of the examples I'm going to show you is the NMR. You heard me talk about this earlier. NMR is almost a million dollars. And already, Moravian was collaborating, coming over to Muhlenberg to use our instrument. That's my hand um, in this video that we made. And so we made the videos, and we clipped them, and, and we added captions, and we did all this stuff to make it ADA compliant. And then we assessed our students. And so here's one of those things that, you know, hindsight's 2020. I didn't know that all those years I was teaching organic chemistry without videos, I should have been assessing how badly my students were doing on operating this instrument. So I don't have quantitative data to show you that, um, hey, before we started the videos, students broke a lot more stuff and didn't learn as well. Except that they broke a lot more stuff and they didn't learn as well. Right? There was a lot of fear associated with approaching the instrument. It's big, it's expensive, we yell at them when they break it. And there was a lot of like, <laughs> like stress um, coming in. Having the videos to watch, and it took two videos to do it. You can see in this class, there was this particular class, there were 62 students. Um, they played the video an average of two times, both videos. Now we know, based on the number of visits, they weren't playing it all the way through every time, right? Um, and they weren't viewing the entire video for the entire amount of time. Isn't this funny? Like they only used to watch two and a half minutes of it even though it's four minutes long. Like I, I don't understand that. But they think they've gotten three quarters of the way through and it's good. But um, what we did observe is that nobody broke it! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> which is outstanding! And um, we were actually able to assess with a lab practical, which we'd never done before, um, on this instrument. And 86% passed it. 86%. So these are like biology, neuroscience majors, public health. Like they're not going to be chemists, but they can use this million dollar piece of instrumentation and not and actually collect data and interpret that data and not break it. So we were pretty happy with those outcomes. Um, Dr. Barr, Marsha Barr, is a recognized expert on microwave acceleration, which was our next example. We have several microwaves. We're the only uh, campus in the valley that has microwave acceleration centers. So if you want to do microwave chemistry, we're the place to come. Which you didn't know you could use microwaves for chemistry. <laughs> really, right? Um, you gotta have still reinforced microwave in case it blows up, but other than that, it's exactly the same one you have in your kitchen. So we were able to do some more targeted assessment here, and what this graph is showing is, I like this particular one, I, I will be able to perform the technique at hand without an instructor demonstration. So of the vast majority of our students are reporting that I can do this. I feel comfortable walking into lab. It's all anonymous. They don't have to tell us they feel comfortable. But they, they say they feel comfortable. We can assess them. They can do the technique. And they don't break our stuff. So this was um, microwave acceleration. And that was Marsha Barr. And then solid phase synthesis. This was an advanced class. So this was taking it up the next level. And um, so these students are juniors and seniors. And so there was some theory that it, when by recording the video, Dr. Young was able to actually do a little bit more in the classroom on the theory and the reasoning behind the experiment rather than the how of the experiment. And all the students were able to complete the technique. Um, 
And she actually did content-based assessment. So could they actually compare and contrast? Could they actually assess when they needed to use the technique? Could they actually do the technique? Could they identify a step and the importance of that step in the technique? So this was more content-driven. And again, the students are, by and large, reporting they can, they can do it. And this was the first time this technique rolled out at Muhlenberg. So this had previously been at Lehigh, and it came, came to Muhlenberg. I talk really fast. How am I doing? OK. So um, at this point, what, what did we learn? So you showed the three examples I gave you were from Muhlenberg. And that is pretty much where we've made the video. That's where we've made most of the video. Um, because I was the one that started it, and because I, had the in, I built the in-house expertise, I was able to teach Marsha Barr and Sherry Young, my colleagues. And then we created a cell that has kind of trickled out. Now, because we have a presence on campus, there's a lot more people doing this sort of thing. Um, the other campuses, Radian and Lehigh, it was a lot harder um, for them. It, uh, Lehigh's instructional designer went on maternity leave. Like there was just there was just a lack of support um, for those folks at their campuses. And at Lehigh, for example, Mark Snyder, he's uh, he's doing research 90% of his time. He's not necessarily in the classroom as much. So the other thing I learned is that it takes a lot longer to do what you think, the, what you propose, than what you think. Um, during the semester, we had a really hard time getting this stuff up and running. Honestly, without the Teagle and the kind of the cohort identity and the, ex the external um, accountability, we probably wouldn't have even gotten as far as we did at Muhlenberg. But I can, I can speak with extreme confidence about the quality of the learning outcomes that we're seeing from what we have done. What um, we learned in hindsight was that playing to your strengths with existing collaborations was really helpful. So we already had Steve Dunham coming to Muhlenberg to use our NMR. That was a natural fit. And so now it's easy. He wants to bring a student. There's a whole series of videos that student can be trained on. When they get there, they can collect data. There's none of this like, press this, hold this, don't stand here, right? As well as he can um, spend time on higher order stuff. The sax instrument at um, Small Angle X-ray Scattering at Lehigh, again, the students were able to just go in there and collect data rather than spending all this time learning how to use the instrument. So assessment, um, always really important. I, I think you should always assess because you just never know when you're going to need that data that you didn't think you were going to need 10 years ago, right? Like before we started implementing videos, like it would be sure be nice if we had data on how much they sucked before we implemented the videos. Um, but we don't, we don't have that data. So always assessing. And I put up some clips of our videos here because I wanted to show how they are, I think, high quality and professional, but they're, these are not Hollywood videos, right? One of the things that always reduces faculty anxiety is these are my hands. I never actually fully appear in body in the video, <laughs> right? Why? Because everyone gets all like, like worked up, like, ah, what does my hair look like? Like, is my makeup okay? And that's not the point. The point is the technique. The point is the teaching. Um, and in this particular case, this is a student. <laughs> Marsha used a student in her video instead of being in it herself. But this is her voice and, and, and her content she created. And so you can do this. Like, it's actually not that hard. And um, we've actually seen a lot of productive learning. So that's the end of my story. All right, so my name is Jennifer Rao. I have been working with the Teagle project since about October as a project manager. So as Sean mentioned in our intro, we started off with a full-time instructional designer who did a lot of great work with our faculty, um, helping them build their modules and their videos. Um, she actually got a full-time faculty position at one of her institutions, which was great. So then as the project was coming to a close, I was brought on to kind of help wrap things up in a more project management type role. So what I've really been doing since the fall is meeting with the last uh, three years worth of project teams one-on-one -on -one to learn about their projects, learn about some of these things that Chris and Carrie have talked about, you know, what worked, what didn't, and what can we do as a, the Alvea Consortium to better help support faculty who want to do these types of collaborative projects moving forward. So thinking about that sustainability piece. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons we've learned, um, more of how we could do things a little bit differently to help these projects. So one of the things is more of a formal kickoff to the project. So again, we mentioned we did these sharing symposiums where the outgoing uh, faculty projects presented to the incoming faculty to share about their lessons learned. 
But then doing a little bit more, you know, and then the teams would each meet, but um, actually doing more like formal project management. So, okay, what is your goal and what is the deadline? Are you trying to create a course for the following spring? Okay, so what do you need to have by the fall to tell the registrar? What date is that? What are all the pieces you need to have in place to, to get from start to finish? Um, making sure recurring meetings were on the calendar also. So this, we often would have these kickoffs in the spring and then after graduation everybody disperses for the summer. So making sure you have you know, a set plan in place, set meetings, and a set you know, priority list will definitely help things flow a lot more smoother, I think. And then assigning group leaders. So as you know, Carrie mentioned, she was kind of the driving force of her team. And, and that was great, but some of the groups didn't have that, you know, that leader that kind of emerged naturally. So making sure there's somebody that is the main point of contact for each group that can, you know, keep up to date with where everybody is, um, make sure everyone, you know, is reminding me about the meetings and things like that, sort of just that, that, that glue that keeps the team together would definitely be good to have as well. And then contingency plans. So again, I, it's like from what a lot of Chris and Carrie said, um, by putting a plan in place early on and really laying out the steps, you can maybe identify some of the roadblocks you might hit earlier on in the project. So, um, for example, there were some teams that relied on specific courses being taught. Well, what happens if there's low enrollment and that course doesn't run that semester? These are one-year projects, so you can't really wait, right? So you need to have a backup plan of, is there a different course that we can use or a different way that faculty member can be involved? Or, um, again, thinking about the lab videos, one of the faculty that, at Moravian that I talked with um, their piece of equipment had a computer with a very old operating system that screen capture software couldn't work on. And so that was sort of a roadblock they hit all of a sudden. They were chugging along, doing great, and then it was like, you know, the semester was starting, everyone got busy, you hit this roadblock, and everything kind of falls apart. So, um, you know, being able to have contingency plans in place for some of those things and, and identifying them up front would definitely be helpful to keep things moving along. And also thinking about the kickoff and about team building. So um, a lot of the faculty at our sixth institution, some of them know one another well and have worked together before, but in the cases where faculty teams sort of formed virtually, maybe that meeting, that kickoff, is really the first time they're actually meeting in person. So how do you, you know, really build them as a more, you know, build that camaraderie and build that sort of team, team spirit? Doing, you know, the typical icebreakers or some team building exercise might help with that. And um, so managing different kinds of personalities is something, uh, so when I joined Elvaic, we had, uh, one of my colleagues does the MBTI, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, and so we all did it and got our assessment, and I think, I think that was great, because um, she is actually a certified coach and sits down with you and helps you understand what your personality type is and how, how to work within your comfort zone as well as out of your comfort zone. So it helps you better understand your colleagues and where they're coming from. So again, building that sort of uh, thinking of how we can use those tools to help build that sort of team camaraderie and help the collaboration, you know, work better together is definitely something we can start to do as a, as a, as a consortium. And then involving the ITID folks. So uh, that's something we started to do, but I think if, if they really were a core part of the team, like Chris was saying, if, if there was that IT person that was part of that team that was there in the room that they could be focusing on that IT piece so you can focus on what you need to do, and, and everybody comes together, it'll make things happen a lot smoother, I think. Um, and that kind of leads into just more unified technical support in general for the faculty on all of our campuses. So again, this reflects back to a lot of what you've heard from, from the last two talks. Our campuses are all very different as far as some are all Mac campuses, some, many of them are Mac and PC, so you have people on different computers and operating systems, different types of software available to do that video editing, and then different LMS systems. So we have Blackboard, Canvas, and Moodle at our six colleges. So how do you manage all of that when you're building these course materials or wanting to share courses? Um, you know, because every, each one of those has slight different nuances to things you can actually do within them. So, again, having the IT support involved early will really help kind of drive, well, what is the best option for us to do? And then also, you know, as far as software support, um, we had some teams that used free open source apps and software, which is great, but then the next year they went to do the same course and it was gone. You know, it's no longer supported. So again, having IT in to say, okay, well, that's a great app, but let's look at, you know, how, um, how, what's the history of it? Is it a well-supported app? Is it a well-established app or, or, or software? If not, if it looks like it could be something that could disappear, maybe we have an alternative we could suggest. So again, having that tech, more, a stronger technical support for the faculty is definitely something we need to do a little bit better. 
Um, along those lines, this slide is more of the, you know, pie in the sky. If we could get there, uh, it would be great. Um, so Federated ID is something that they've been kicking around at our IT departments at the six schools for quite a while. And so Federated ID is something similar to what you see here with Eduroam. So I was able to log in with some, I have Lafayette credentials still, so I was able to log in to Eduroam on the Wi-Fi with my Lafayette credentials. So it's that, that idea of using your home credentials at other institutions. So we've been trying to get that at our, our Alvaic schools because then when students cross register, they don't have to get a whole separate set of credentials. They can use their credentials to log into the other school's LMS system. Same with faculty. So when um, you know when you guys were co-teaching a course, or you know, or like even with Sabrina's course and your course, if you could have logged into one another's LMS systems to see what did they do, how, what were the students you know like and stuff like that in there, and being able to see that that would definitely be beneficial. And we, I've heard that from a number of faculty because we do have a shared documentary story making minor, or filmmaking minor, right? Um, so where the teachers or the faculty are teaching um, courses in sequence. So being able to share some of their materials and share some of that would definitely be helpful. And then the other idea we've kicked around is taking what we had, the instructional designer, and expanding that a little bit to be even a more shared IT resource. So one that actually is a little bit more embedded with each of the IT departments and has access to their um, hardware and software. So that way when, let's say you have three campuses working on video creation, one of those campuses has really great uh, you know, cameras, lighting, microphones, and stuff like that. So the one faculty is able to use that, but the other two can't. This IT resource could potentially float you know, and, and bring that equipment to each, you know, each faculty and help them really develop it. So, a lot of what we do at Alveic is really trying to figure out what are ways where we can leverage, you know, all of the resources at the campuses to benefit the whole, to benefit all six. So that's one way of, of we've been kicking around the idea of maybe, you know, is that something we should be doing or could be doing to better help the faculty that want to collaborate. And then as far as project closeout, um, I'm going to be working on this summer trying to put together more of a repository of some of the great work that the faculty have done. So another feedback I had gotten from them was after the sharing symposium would happen, then it was sort of like, you know, n there was no real good place to go back after the fact and be like, oh, what was that project so-and-so did? And we have a little bit of information up on our website about each project, but we're going to flesh that out a lot more, actually put up some of these great presentations our faculty have presented, some of the videos they've created, make sure that there's, you know, a great showcase to, to, to let them show all the work that they did, and then hopefully that will um, inspire future faculty to want to do more of this type of collaborative effort moving forward. And, and that's really the next goal for us is to figure out the sustainability piece of how do we you know, encourage more of this because it's definitely beneficial for the students and um, we you know, definitely want to see more of these types of projects occur at our consortium and at our six schools. So Diane is actually going to talk a little bit more about how we're going to do that and how we want to support both the faculty that have done the projects for Teagle, you know, if they want to keep going, as well as new projects. Yeah. And thanks everybody for being here. I'm Diane Dimitrov, and I'm the Executive Director of the Lehigh Valley Association of Independent Colleges and the Co-PI on this project. And Sean and I were just saying yesterday, we can't believe that the project is wrapping up. It's actually been a four-year uh, project for us because it started for us as a planning grant. So we received the call for proposals in the fall of 2013. So actually that makes it almost a five-year project. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's interesting as we think about this in retrospect, what we were really setting out to achieve in 2013 when we wrote our very first proposal has been achieved in a number of different ways at the same time, but not necessarily as a result of our project. So we think that our project has achieved a number of things um, that may, perhaps we didn't expect, but uh, the things that were really important to us as we set out to this project, we've achieved at the same time, but not necessarily just because of the work that we've done. So, Oops. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we go from here. We were really happy to be able to showcase two of our successful projects um, here. Just to, to reiterate what our overall project was, as Sean mentioned, our goal was to really create momentum around digital literacy across our campus communities. And that really, we feel, has been achieved. And some, we'd like to think, is related to the work that we've done on this project. At the same time, in the last, we'll call it now, four and a half years since we wrote our initial proposal, there have been a number of other activities on all of our campuses that have really fueled the momentum 
across our campus communities in terms of incorporating digital tools and digital pedagogies into our classes. And so we think that there really is a lot of momentum across our campuses and that when we think, and we met yesterday with the Teagle folks to talk, as did some of the other folks in the room, to, um, to talk about how, how we thought the success of our projects went. And we do think that we have sufficient momentum across our community related to the use of digital pedagogies and digital tools that it will be sustained when this project is, is put to bed. So we're pleased about that. Again, not necessarily just because of the work that we did, but we're very pleased about that. This project, um, our project overall, was part of a consortial project that the Teagle Foundation sponsored. So in the fall of 2013, we'll go back yet again, four and a half years, the Teagle Foundation released a call for proposals and the call was only to consortia. So proposals were only accepted from groups of higher education institutions working together. And so their goal was to really look at this question of hybrid learning in residential settings in collaborative environments. So it wasn't just this question of hybrid learning in residential settings, it was also related to how it works, how it can work across campus communities because another part of their goal was really looking at how do you take maximum advantage of the resources that you have in ways that can help reduce the cost of education to students. So that was a, that was a component part of what Teagle included in their original call for proposals. So as we think about um, where we go from here, I think Sean mentioned, or I believe it was Sean mentioned, we really looked at how to achieve our project through what we call organic initiatives. These were things from which faculty had passion, and so they came forward from the faculty. They were not, they were not defined and then sought um, faculty to, to work on those. However, the strategic priority, the institutional priority, was this question of creating momentum around digital literacy. So we. I think we're happy because we were able to make progress on a strategic priority. This is around creating momentum on digital literacy through the use of organic projects. And so that, for us, is, is a big success. We're very pleased about that. Um, and then, again, just to summarize, Sean mentioned that, and I think you've heard others mention that we used ro rolling cycles. So in the course of our four-year project, we had 12 faculty teams working on projects. They represented a total of four course-related projects, that's the kind of project you heard Chris talk about, and eight course material-related projects, and that's the kind of project you heard Carrie talking about. And we think that these represent two of our successful projects, and we wish every one of our projects was, was as successful as these, and we had varying degrees of success with some of the other ones. So as we think about how to take it forward, I want to talk, so we talked a little bit about some of the um, challenges. You've heard other folks talk about collaboration. I want to talk about that, and then I want to talk about our next steps. So, um, uh -oh. Here we go. Sorry. Okay, so I would say we had three different kinds of challenges, and you've heard others talk about them. Um, you've, heard, you've heard both Carrie and Chris talk about some of the challenges related to collaboration across campuses. Our consortium, while it's 50 years old, um, it ebbs and flows, just like any of the other consortia that are, related, that are represented here in the room. And so sometimes we are focusing on what we call those organic projects, sometimes we're more focused on strategic projects. Our foundation does not include a robust transportation system, even though we are only 25 miles apart from end to end in our group. And so one of our challenges as we think about collaboration for our students historically has been transportation. We do think that technology will help us as we take that into the future, that that will help mitigate that, as, believe it or not, does Uber. So um, <laughs> that's actually been, Uber has actually been really helpful in addressing some of our uh, transportation challenges because we don't sponsor a robust transportation system. Um, so we've, you've heard some of our folks talking about some of the challenges of collaboration. One of the specific things that we ran into was that, and we learned this, we didn't understand this at the beginning, people define collaboration differently. So you've heard, you've heard Carrie talking about, we looked at all these pieces of equipment, we decided which ones we needed to do and who was going to do what. That group, as a group, decided how they were going to do their work. In some cases, collaboration means we got $5,000, so you get 1000 and you get 1000 and you get 1000 and you get 1000 And so what we learned was that the groups that didn't spend the time on the front end to agree on what their collaboration was going to be had more difficulty than the groups that defined it right out of the shoot. So that was absolutely a challenge for us. 
And then you also heard Jen talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we encountered with project management. We especially encountered challenges where groups didn't have a clear leader, and, or they didn't clearly agree that they weren't going to have a clear leader, where they, they just sort of bumbled along. And those groups were much less successful than the uh, projects that, that you saw showcased here today. Now, this is going the wrong way. There we go. And the third of our challenges really was this question of maximizing resources. And we get back to what Teagle had asked of us in their original um, proposal, which is how, how do you take maximum advantage of the resources that your campuses have in a collaborative way as you think about this challenge of incorporating hybrid learning? And so, again, I think we, we showcased, I hope we showcased two examples where we really brought together intellectual resources and looked at how to take maximum advantage of the intellectual resources of our faculty, as well as, in Chris's example, of the resources that students were creating. And so how do we share those things in ways that add value to our students? And then in Carrie's example, that was a fabulous example. We thought, we, we thought from the very beginning that was a fabulous example of how do we take maximum of value, maximum advantage of really expensive resources that campuses have invested um, in acquiring, and so how do you take maximum advantages and, and share those across the community? So we, we think that that, that is an area where um, these projects were really successful. As we think about how to take that forward, Again, this is this balance between what we call strategic and organic projects. Strategic projects tend to be focused on institutional wins, organizational wins, and individual projects tend to be focused on individual faculty wins or student wins. How do we, and if those are not the same, how do we find projects that bring all of those together so everybody wins? So that's really important to us as we think about um, how do we successfully maximize our resources. How do we think about continuing to invest in collaboration? So I think you heard us talk about issues that we've had with technology and making sure that we are, we've, made a, we've actually made a strategic decision. We're not necessarily going to invest in the same technologies long term, but we're going to invest in making sure that we can, in, we can have our technologies interface. Um, since Carrie and Chris's project, since the year that they did their projects, because they were early in, in our overall program, we have made a commitment in, in the next year, we made a commitment to say, okay, all of our campuses are going to use Zoom as our video technology. Now, that's not a lifetime commitment because Zoom changes. So every year we look at that and we say, okay, are we still good for Zoom for next year? And so as of right now, next year, we're still gonna use Zoom. But we, again, that's not a lifetime commitment because technology is changing so fast. And our technology groups, as probably is true on all of your campuses, our technology groups are always exploring new technologies. And so how do we make sure that we don't stifle that? We want to make sure that we have the opportunity to take advantage of that innovation without changing everything every minute. I don't know about you, but when someone says to me every week, okay, you should try this new tool, I think, I can't try a new tool this week. <laughs> I tried a new tool last week, I gotta wait till next week. <laughs> so, so how do we think about investing in making sure those technologies can interface rather than just investing in technology. And then as we think about um, sustainability, so one of the areas that is really important as we go forward is really thinking about how do we have some kind of a repository, you heard Jen talk about that, that doesn't duplicate effort. So we don't want to create, we want to spend a lot of energy, resources, money, people to create another repository if we have good repositories. Maybe we're, maybe it's better for us to connect the ones we have. Maybe it's not because we don't have good ones yet. So that's an exploration that we need to do as we think about taking this forward. Um, so, I'm not get that right. I just wanted to spend a half a second talking about how we think about collaboration at Elbaic. And if you're interested, the detailed version of this is on our website. And this is not intended for you to read it all. And we've actually grossly abbreviated this. So this is, though, the concept that I'd be interested in having you think about is we think there are stages of collaboration. And the collaboration advances, but it, it also iterates. And it starts with groups that just communicate. And in our project, we had groups that just communicated. They didn't really share anything. They just they told each other things. And you move into a level where you're cooperating, which is now where you're starting to say, okay, maybe I'll share a little bit with you, to where you're coordinating, and that's where I'll do this if you do this. That's kind of coordinating, to true collaborating. And that's where, okay, now let's figure out how we're going to do that together. And we look at that on a variety of scales, but the one that's really important and we think is really foundational as we think about our projects going forward is trust. And if our groups don't have trust, 
they don't take risks. And the kinds of things that we're asking people to do, which are different than they were doing yesterday, all require risk taking. So trust is this really important component of any kind of collaborative project. Again, this is on our website in greater detail. This is what we call the Elvaic version, and we have adopted it from, and I'll try to get my uh, reference correct, from Mattage. And again, the full version of this is on our website where each of these blocks is filled out. And so again, this is just intended to be an illustration. But thinking about collaboration in terms of it being something that does iterate and it grows um, based on how well trust is established. So here's our next step. And Sean's telling me I have five minutes to wrap this up here. So here's our next step. We, we are really pleased and very, very proud of the output of our project. And again, we had four projects that looked at courses. We had eight projects that looked at course materials. The course materials projects actually were probably more successful, generally, than the course projects. And so as we go forward, the question is, how can we get some momentum around some course projects? And so we will be launching, um, we hope this year will be the first annual, but this will be the first, what we call our course Chautauqua which will really be looking at how do you create courses for collaborative delivery. So how do you get faculty to come together to develop a curriculum and think about multi-campus delivery so that you, you plan a course. Maybe it's only taught by one faculty member, but it's intended for delivery across multiple campuses. One of the things that did come out of our project was that we were able to stand up a shared minor during the time of our, of our Teagle project in documentary story making, you heard someone else reference this. And um, that is the kind of course model that we hope will come out of this, um, this work. So this is our next step. This is what we hope will not just sustain some of the work that we've done, but help us grow it. So this is, this is where we expect to take it later this summer. Um, 